Good morning, First Church. How is everybody this morning? Let's all stand and begin worship together. could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and leave me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Oh, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me into the to those around me. I will build my life upon. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you, O oh Lord, and I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation i will put my trust in you oh lord and i will not be taken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you, O oh Lord, and I will not be shaken. Amen. Father God, I thank you so much for the love that you give to us, that you could build our lives upon your love. Lord, I thank you for the day that you've given us, and I thank you that that we can stand here and worship you and praise your name, Lord. And I pray that as Jeremy comes up to deliver your message, Lord, I pray that, that our hearts are, will be open and our minds will be open for you so we can, we can receive your message and we can receive your word, Lord. We love you. And thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you would grab your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, we're going to skip ahead a little bit this week. And uh, next Sunday, we're going to come back to chapter 4, um, and we're going to finish up the, this series next Sunday. And so uh, this morning, we're going to look at, I found a reason to lead and follow. How many of you would love to be a good or a great leader? I mean, I think we all aspire to be somebody that people can follow. I'm glad you raised your hand, Gary, <laughs> one of our leaders, right? Uh, 
What's interesting is, uh, well, I'll come back to that in a minute, but some of you may know a uh, motivational speaker and author, Ken Blanchard, author of The One Minute Manager. It's probably his most familiar book. I've read some of his stuff. He's a really cool uh, author and writer. A number of years ago, Ken Blanchard um, gave his life to Christ, and he became convinced that Jesus was the greatest leader of all time. Isn't that cool? And his idea was we would all do well to analyze Jesus' leadership style and emulate it, follow it, to lead like Jesus. And that kind of mirrors a verse that we've looked at in this series from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, where Peter said, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I love that verse. Like we ought to be living our lives as Jesus lived his. And so not, as, not only is Jesus the savior of our souls, but he's the model for our everyday lives. What's interesting, about the same time that Ken Blanchard was discovering leadership lessons from Jesus, a man named Jim Collins, also another leadership guru, but a non-Christian, was working on his best-selling book called From Good to Great. I've read some of his stuff. He's a good author, great, got some great leadership skills that you can uh, apply and things like that. But Jim Collins, in this book, researched a number of top organizations to find out what made these organization, organizations not just good, but great? What made these organizations like the top in their industry, the top of their field? And so he analyzed these corporations and he found out, I'll just give you the first one. Number one, the top of the list that makes an organization great is what he called the level five leader. A level five leader. A level five leader he described as someone who is at the top of the organization and it's in whom everyone places their confidence. They trust him, and they trust him to lead. What, it, what Jim Collins found out was that the most effective long-term leaders are not these larger-than-life saviors. They're, they're, they're not people with big personalities that overwhelm people. In fact, what he found was uh, that these level five leaders are typically quiet, humble, reserved, gracious, mild-mannered. They're very ambitious, but not for themselves, but for the good of the, the organization. When I read the book and I came to that description of a level five leader, I thought, who does that sound like? Jesus. He's not a Christian, but man, he's, he'd be describing Jesus through and through, right? So I want to be a good leader. If I'm going to be a good leader, I ought to emulate Jesus. Now, the other side of this coin is this. Business leaders don't really emphasize something that the Bible talks quite a bit about. And that is, in the Bible, yeah, we find what it means to be a good leader. We have many examples, Moses and Aaron and all these guys that ever lived. We can look at them and say, man, I want to lead like that. But what may be more important, and probably what is more important, is how we find in the Bible that we, are, we, we ought to be a level five followers. The Bible talks a lot about follow, being followers, being good followers. And so we are called in our lives, we're really called to follow more than we are called to lead. If you really think about it, we're called to follow more than we are to lead. We follow the rules, we follow the laws, we follow whatever's going on in church and, and out in the society and our bosses and in the workplace. You know, we're called to follow quite frequently. And I think we're more followers more, more of the time than we are leaders. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at both sides of the coin this morning. We're going to look at leaders, and we're going to look at followers, okay? So we'll begin with, first of all, the Christian leader. What does that look like? Look at verse 1 of uh, 1 Peter 5. Peter says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Now, we are going to address, what I'm going to address here this morning is the role of the office of elder, those who are in the eldership um, in particular this morning. I, I want you to know there are other leaders in the church outside of the elders. We have paid staff, obviously. We're leaders. We have teachers of Sunday schools and small groups. Those are leaders. Uh, you know, and, and so there are other leaders, but I really want to specifically address the eldership because we have a huge need 
for developing future elders in our congregation. Can I get an amen, Gary Cooper? <laughs> oh, I got a couple of them. That's awesome. Uh, uh, our elders, I hate to say it, they're getting older. <laughs> uh, but we need some young men to rise up who are willing to be elders to in, at least investigate what that looks like. So we have future elders in our, in our congregation. And so men in this room, if you would consider what it might mean to be an elder, whether or not God has called you to be an elder here at First Church as we go along. So I'm going to address specifically the elders. Now, the word that Peter uses for elders here in verse 1, it really means the spiritually mature men in the church. Those who are spiritually mature. All right? I, I believe Peter's really getting at the office of eldership. But uh, because God has appointed. He wants there to be elders in every congregation. We read about it in the book of Acts. We read it in 1 Timothy. We read it in Titus. We learn more about these, this office of eldership. And so uh, this morning, I'm not going to go to those passages. I want to stay mostly in 1 Peter. But at this church, in our congregation, we currently have what we would call two elders who are in the office of eldership, right? We have Gary Cooper. We have Russ Schreiner. I know that we have more than just two spiritually mature men <laughs> in our church, okay? So we're looking for you guys to, to step up. Um, these two men, they've been nominated by you. They've been approved by you to serve as elders in our congregation, okay? So men, as, again, as we go along here, just want you to consider it. Ask God if, if being an elder is right for you in our church, all right? What's it look like? Let's talk about the responsibilities of the elders. And church, this is for the rest of us too, because we've got to put some expectations out there for these guys, right? Peter says to the elders in verse 2, shepherd God's flock among you. Now, shepherd is another uh, word for elder. Poimain is the Greek word, uh, but it's another word that we use for elder. It's kind of interchangeable with some of the other ones. But the elder, first of all, is to feed the sheep. To feed the sheep. That's their responsibility. <clears throat> in the 23rd Psalm, we have this beautiful picture, right? David says in the first two verses, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It's a beautiful picture of, <clears throat> of a sheep that has so much to eat that he is content to just lie down in these lush green pastures. Sheep tend to eat everything. <clears throat> but to be able to be so content that you don't really care about the rest of what's out there yet, that is, that's the idea of how elders are to feed the sheep in our congregation. The elders in the church are to feed our sheep the Word of God. We here at First Church, we place a high value on, on the Bible, on God's Word. Uh, we place a high value in teaching it and preaching it. This is where we go all the time. It's the meat, milk, honey, bread, water that nourish the soul. Jesus said in Matthew 4, right? Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God's mouth. That's what we believe, that we are going to feed on this. And so the idea is that the elders are to feed the sheep so well that we're contented and that we are not hungry. Because hungry people are often irritable, restless, and weak. How many of you use the, the, we've coined this phrase, uh, hangry? Anybody use that word, hangry? <laughs> I'm hangry. What does that mean? Well, I'm so hungry that I'm just angry. And that's, the, that's what hungry people look like. But if we are feeding on the Word of God, we'll be contented, we'll be full, and we'll be well-nourished. Often... The restlessness that exists in churches exists because the people have not been feeding on God's Word. They're hungry. So the elders, the elders' job is to feed, to make sure that our sheep, our flock, all of us are fed the Word of God. Secondly, the elders are to protect the sheep. They're here for our protection. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, he tells the, uh, the elders in the church of Ephesus, he says, be on guard for yourselves, elders, and also for all the flock, the whole church of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. That's another word for elder. To shepherd, there's the word for elder as well, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Then he says, I know that after my departure, after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. 
Therefore, be on the alert. Okay, so elders, and, and, and Paul's charge here is that the elders must protect the church, first of all, against external adversaries who would threaten the well-being and the life of the church. So in other words, our elders might say, uh, we're not going to have certain guest speakers in our Sunday morning worship services because they have a different doctrine than we do. Because we don't want false truths preached in our church. And so our elders would say, no, they're not welcome to preach here. They may be motivational speakers, they may be great communicators, but we don't want people outside of our doctrine and what we believe because we don't want that to infiltrate and make it worse for us. But more on that doesn't really happen that often. More often, the danger comes internally among our own people through people that are divisive, they're ego-driven, uh, they're basically bent on destroying the church. And so things might happen. If a small group leader uh, starts teaching that God or that Jesus wasn't really God's son, you can't have that, right? If a church member begins to spread vicious gossip and to slander our leaders maliciously, uh, I mean, we can't have that, right? If, if a staff member uh, gets involved in, in immoral activities, the elders are to step in and protect the flock, to remove those people or at least to uh, discipline them so it doesn't happen anymore, okay? It doesn't happen often. Really, it doesn't, but it does happen on occasion, and so the elders are to protect the sheep. They're to protect our congregation. The third one is elders have a responsibility to guide the sheep. And we'll come back to this in a moment, but verse 3, Peter says that the elders, the shepherds, are to be examples to the flock. Good leaders lead by example, not by throwing out a bunch of directives. <laughs> sheep, you may know this, sheep cannot be effectively driven. You start to drive sheep, what happens? They scatter. They go everywhere. When a uh, so sheep follow the shepherd that they have confidence in. And so we, our elders, we try to instill confidence in you by asking you to do things that we ourselves would actually do. We don't ask you to do anything that we're, we're not going to do as well. And so we're going to lead by example. Our elders are going to lead by example. So our elders feed, protect, and guide the congregation. Now we're going to look at four characteristics for being good shepherds. What's that look like? What characteristics should they have? Verse 2, Peter says, Shepherd God's flock among you, uh, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Now this is really cool. God, we have to understand, elders, that God has called you. One of the characteristics of being an elder is that you are called by God to serve in that capacity. I've been in elders, uh, candidates meetings where they never even talked about God's calling in their lives. You think I want those people to be an elder? No, nah, if you can't tell me that God called you, it doesn't make any sense. So being, because being an elder in a church is a, is a very tedious task. We have long meetings. <laughs> we make difficult decisions. We've even had some heated discussions, right? <laughs> In the end, it's a tedious task, but we're united and we come out of it, you know, if everything is okay, but it's a thankless and demanding role. It's really not for the faint of heart. It's something to really consider and to ask God, are you calling me to this position? It's not something that you should do because you're feeling pressure to do it. You should do it because you love the church, you love Jesus, and God is calling you to serve, okay? Verse 2. Now, the rest of verse 2 says, um, uh, not out of greed for money, but eagerly. I'll just say this up front. There's no money to be made being an elder, right, Gary? <laughs> we gave all our elders a 100% raise this year. Guess what number that is? Zero. <laughs> There's no money to be made being an elder, okay? <laughs> um, but listen, if people... Oh, I want to give you the point there. We're looking for good shepherds who are unselfish and enthusiastic unselfish and enthusiastic, to be excited about the future of the church. We're looking for, for men that are, are willing to say, man, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. God is going to grow this church, and we're going to do great things for the kingdom of heaven. Those are, that's the type of enthusiasm we need. But also at the same point, to be unselfish. If people feel they're being taken advantage of, they're likely not going to be enthusiastic followers. And so... Uh, an elder is not going to be greedy for, for money. He's going to be looking out for the best interests 
of his followers and not in himself. Okay, uh, Verse 3, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. We're looking for good shepherds to be shapers. A good leader is a shaper. Now we'll go back to this verse 3, right? Uh, um, the word for being examples here means to form or to mold. It's the idea of our elders are actually the shape that you want to fit in because they are, they are following the example of Christ. That's kind of a neat word. Like, I want to emulate what they're doing. And so our elders are to be overseers, not overlords, Peter said, right? So we're looking for leaders who can be emulated or copied because they're walking in Jesus' footsteps. We're looking for leaders who, are, uh, who motivate people by love and example, not by force or by threats. Peter got it. He didn't say, I demand you to, uh, as the lead apostle, I demand you as one of Jesus' favorites, right? He was one of the top three. Or I demand you as the pillar of the Jerusalem church. He didn't say any of that. No, he said, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. We're in this together. And I want to be a good example that you can emulate. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I love this because we believe good shepherds, good leaders are to be kingdom focused. Kingdom focused. Uh, sometimes we, we have to make tough decisions. We sit in, a, in the boardroom, if you will, <laughs> and we just, oh man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, right? We know we're not going to please everybody all the time. I wish we could. Uh, but sometimes we've got we've got to make decisions that it's going to make some people angry or it might might set them off a little bit. Um, but a shepherd who seeks to first please people won't be a leader very long. He'll become known as a crowd pleaser, and he's not going to be a very effective leader in the long run. A good leader is worth following because he's following the one worth following. He serves to please God, not man. That's what he exists for. So if you're looking to be an elder because you have an agenda, because you want things done in a particular way, in your way, if you're looking to be an elder because you have uh, some ideas uh, that you, know, you want to, I don't know, change things up because, like I said, you want it your way, you're not, the, you're not the right person for the job. We are looking for kingdom-focused men who will constantly be asking the question. We ask this question in, in every decision we make. What would God have us to do? Right, Gary? We ask that a lot. What does God want us to do? We ask that a lot. And that's, that's the type of men we're looking for. We're looking for kingdom-focused men who will, are not afraid to stop and pray and ask God for His wisdom. We're looking for kingdom-focused men who serve for God's approval, not for man's approval. And so again, men in the room, if this excites you, if it's something that you think God's calling you to do, I'm not saying you have to be an elder tomorrow, but we want to start training. We want to start shepherding some younger men to be able to step up someday and be elders in this congregation. Please come talk to me or, or talk to Gary today before you leave and, and, and let's get on that path because we need elders for the future of our church, okay? Let's talk about the follower. All of us in this room, we are followers, right? Verses 5 and 6. In the same way, you who are younger be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Let's talk about the, a good follower. A good follower is, first of all, humbly submissive. Humbly submissive. That's like the first quality Peter points out. You're to be humble. Humble yourselves, right? Now, you can have one of two extreme reactions when it comes to following leaders. On one extreme, you have cynicism or this arrogant distrust of all leaders. So you're not going to follow anybody. On the other extreme, you, you have this idealism. Uh, you kind of naively put leaders on this pedestal and you kind of worship them. And, and you, I mean, you'll just blindly follow with, without giving it any thought. We don't want you to be on either of those extremes. We want you to be in the center, okay? Because in the center is realism. It's, it's realizing that we're following imperfect leaders. Sorry, Gary. <laughs> we're following imperfect leaders 
for the sake of our perfect God. So this is where you recognize that a leader is called, is gifted, is sincere, is attempting to follow God's will, despite the hang-ups and things like that. A good follower then is not, a resentful, is not resentful of not being a leader. A good follower won't sabotage a leader's direction. They won't undermine what's going on. A follower has this eager, cooperative, humble spirit. I will go because they're trying to look like God and they're trying to lead us to better things in, in, in light of the church and, and everything. I know it's easy to be a good follower as long as there are good leaders. No doubt about it. But when we don't have confidence in the leaders, we can get moody. We can become negative. We can jump in the car after church and start complaining and being critical. And Can you believe that leader? Yeah, okay. You do it around the dinner table. Oh, man, so-and-so, right? Some of you probably think I got cameras in your house watching you. <laughs> Anyway, it's true. We start complaining about our leaders, but the, the question we have to ask is this. How can I be a level five follower when I'm not being led by a level five leader? And that's tough. I, I think we have level five leaders. I, these guys are just amazing. But what if that's not the case? An ego-driven, discontented follower who constantly ridicules the leader behind his back, it dampens the spirits it creates division in the church, and it makes the entire organization ineffective because it's constantly being undermined by the critical and the complainers and the slanderers. But if we know, and I'm telling you, these, this is our leaders, if we know that our leaders are trying to do their best to follow God and to do what's best for our church family, then our humble support can help strengthen the organization, and I guarantee you the church will grow as it has. We may not like a certain leader. Uh, we might not get along very well with certain leaders. Um, but our humble support of those leaders can strengthen the organization. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, uh, quarterback. He may not like the coach of the team, but the quarterback, he gets in line with a game plan and says, okay, I'm going to make it happen. He supports it. It's the esteemed teacher who speaks up for her principal's philosophies, even though she might not like her principal. It's the lead salesman who endorses the CEO's new direction. He may just absolutely hate the CEO, but he's going to follow the new direction. Why? Because their contributions as humble, submissive uh, followers are, are so invaluable. They know it brings a lot to the organization. How many of you, how many of you remember the movie, Remember the Titans? Remember that movie? Man, what a great movie. I, I, I love to watch that. It's a football movie. A high school had hired its first black coach in the county. True story. The assistant coach, who was white, wanted the coach's job, one of the head coach's job, and was hired as the assistant coach under this black coach, and he was in a position. He could either undermine the new coach or humble himself and accept that guy as the coach and be an enthusiastic follower. If you've seen the movie, you know in time he chose to be a positive supporter of the new coach. What ended up happening was the football team uh, got better. They had a winning season, and they created racial harmony among the teammates. That's what happens when we may not like certain leaders, but we get on board with what the overall structure is going to be. A good follower is willing sometimes to swallow pride and to humble himself before others so that God can use the organization to grow. God honors that. Peter said, God gives grace to the humble, and He will exalt you. He will do great things in your life and in the life of the church. Next one, a good follower is divinely strengthened. This is good. Um, he says in verse uh, 7, Casting all your cares on Him, that's God, because He cares about you. We love this verse, don't we? Now listen, a level five follower is not someone who continuously dumps problems and pressures on other people. <laughs> now, the Bible teaches us, yes, we ought to bear one another's burdens. So there are times when if you're going through something pretty rough, pretty traumatic, it's okay to share your problems with people so that they can pray for you. 
but a constant fretting and a constant coming to a certain person all the time to share your anxieties and personal issues and to complain. It is draining on the morale of the organization. It's draining on the person. It saps the leader's energy. It's draining. And so Peter's idea here is, yeah, take your cares to people, have them pray for you, but don't continually do that. Why? Because you have this God in heaven who cares for you, who wants to answer your prayers, who wants to take care of you. And so Peter encourages us to put our trust in God in a significant way. Okay. The next one, I know we're going fast. There's a lot here. I apologize for that. But uh, the next one is this, a good follower is fully engaged. These next two verses are two of my favorites in in the, in the whole Bible because it's eye opening. It's, it's very eye awakening. Um, He says in verses eight and nine, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith. Peter knows all about the devil. He does. At the Last Supper, Jesus told Peter, Satan, the devil, he wants to sift you out like wheat. And Peter, in his boastful arrogance, says, Oh no, that's not going to happen, even if I have to die with you. I will never forsake you, Lord. Well, Jesus says, well, guess what? Tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Never, Lord. Not I, right? Well, we know the devil attacked, and Peter fell. He was downed before he even knew what hit him. And Peter was so discouraged by that. He he looked the Lord in the eyes. He just, he wanted to weep, and he ran out of there. Man, he was so discouraged. Why? So he tells us, be alert. He knows what the devil can do. He knows the devil is going to be right there, and we ought to take it seriously. He's stalking you every single day. He's seeking to to trap you in this weak moment. He wants to devour you, to swallow you whole, and to drown you, to take you away from Jesus. The stakes are high, right? If you don't resist the devil... We're talking your eternal destiny, the stability of your marriage, the future of your children, even the survival of a nation. If we allow Satan in our lives, man, it's going to be bad. So Peter, I think he encourages us, don't be lukewarm. Don't be just a casual Christian. Get, as we talked about last week or the week before, get passionately intense for Jesus Christ. Start living out your faith. Kick those sin habits out and resist the devil. Next one, a good follower is mutually inspired. This is good too. Uh, Verse 9, Peter writes, uh, Resist him firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. All right, so be mutually inspired that there are believers sitting next to you in this room who have conquered some pretty cool stuff who have conquered sin in their lives, who have been healed, who have gone through suffering, and they have come out through the other side. We ought to be inspired by that. Or if you're one of those people, we ought to be inspiring to others so that we can uh, help each other grow in the faith, right? And then throughout the world, you think about what people are suffering throughout the world more than we are as Christians. It's amazing. We, we ought to be inspired by them. Next one. A good follower is uh, eternally motivated. In verse 10, he says, The God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. We ought to be eternally motivated um, to to be good followers. I know we all like to receive encouragement. It feels good when somebody comes to me and says, Oh, nice job. Uh, Keep at it. Things like We like to be boosted up, especially by those who are in charge of us. Um, just a little bit of recognition and appreciation. Man, that goes a long way. It motivates us to continue to serve and to to continue to get better at it. But I want to tell you, the best followers in any organization are those who are low maintenance. Low maintenance. I know we don't do a great job of encouraging and uh, showing appreciation, um, but as low maintenance people, we don't necessarily need it. Why is that? Because we we want to do our best, not for the praise of men, but for the praise of God. Colossians 3, 
Paul says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. It is uh, the Lord Christ that you serve. So um, it, it comes down to this. Children, obey your parents, even if they never praise you. Why? Because you're serving a heavenly Father who will one day reward you. Wives, respect your husbands. Even if they're not very loving, even if, even if they're insensitive, continue to love them because you're honoring a groom who notices and will reward you. Students, respect your teachers even if they never learn your name or they never give you a high grade in class. Why? Because you seek to please a rabbi who will one day acknowledge your efforts. Employees, those of you who are still working day in and day out, support your supervisors, even if they're harsh, even if they're inconsiderate, uh, because God is keeping separate books and He will, He is preparing ultimate rewards for you. And He honors you for that. Citizens, uh, respect those in governmental authority, including the police, not because they never abuse their power. We know they do. But because they've been, they've been appointed by the Lord, and you honor God when you respect those in authority. Church members, all of us in this room, right? Be willing to defer to the leaders of this church. Not because you might agree with everything, uh, or because they might be brilliant, more brilliant than you are, or whatever, but because you honor the chief shepherd, and you respect his delegated authority. He will honor you for that. I love Hebrews 13, 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with what? Joy. Joy, and not with grief. Our elders, our staff, anybody that's a leader in this church, we want to serve with joy. But it's up to us followers to make that happen, to, to, to just follow out of respect and knowing that they have the, uh, the ultimate goal and prize, and that's to please Jesus Christ. I'll close with this. The ultimate leader, the ultimate shepherd, Jesus Christ, he said in John chapter 10, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that cool? I invite you this morning, if you haven't made Jesus your Lord and Savior, do it today. Make Him your leader. Give your life to Him um, just say, Lord, you're, you're my Savior, and, and I trust in you. Be baptized today if you haven't been. Baptistry's ready. It's warm. We're ready to go. Those watching on Facebook, please come down and see me or give me a call this week. But give your life to Christ. Um, make, it, make it happen today, okay?